colorful one. You can appreciate what something like this would take. Um, you know, and the thing about Gunnar, there are a number of things that make him a great painter, I think. One of them is his fantastic technique. I mean, he was just a technician. He was a technician's technician in watercolor, which is considered by most painters to be one of the most difficult mediums to work with. He also had a, a, just a, an infallible sense of composition and design. And when we get to the, you know, the landscapes that we're more familiar with in our region here, he's also able to just convey a sense of place that goes beyond mere representation. You know, he's really able to capture the, um, the essence of a location. But he made San Francisco kind of his west coast home. And he always would uh, kind of return there and stay with friends when he was in the coastal area of Northern California. This is a, one of many paintings he did of San Francisco. And if you've been to San Francisco, anybody from San Francisco? Where was this painted from? Can you tell? Yeah, I'm guessing uh, just right around Hayden Ashbury, um, looking east. And so this is before the Bay Bridge was built. This was 1925, yeah, 1925. So before the Bay Bridge, uh, looking at City Hall. I'm going to move again, Bobby. City Hall. Um, and he, you um, never owned a home. His most valuable capital assets in his life were two used automobiles, which were very well used. Um, but he always relied on the generosity and the hospitality of friends when he would travel and uh, needed a place to stay. <coughs> and in 1921, uh, in March of 1921, he made his first visit to Yosemite National Park, which became his probably his, uh, one of his two most favorite subjects, uh, the other being the Grand Canyon. And he made Yosemite uh, one of his semi-permanent homes, and he would stay there off and on for months, uh, well into the late 1920s. And here's a view of a uh, half dome from Glacier Point. And you can imagine that one of the things that attracted him to Yosemite as a subject was the same, were the same things that attracted him to the Grand Canyon. That is, great, great space, you know, deep atmospheric space, contrasted with beautifully architectural, massive rock formations. Um, and as a painter myself, I just can't think of two more wonderful subjects to, to juxtapose. Uh, it was in Yosemite that Gunnar met um, Stephen Mather, the first director of the National Park Service. And Mather uh, became a lifelong friend. And it was Mather who um, suggested to Woodforce that he undertake, you know, kind of a, a project to paint all of the national parks. And Gunnar did take that advice seriously. And, and over time, as the title of the exhibit and the title of my talk reflects, he became known as the painter of the national parks. In, uh, in Yosemite, um, as he did at Grand Canyon, Gunnar established a, a, a relationship with the Yosemite Park and Curry Company, whereby he would exchange paintings for room and board. And he, uh, he made a good living, living selling paintings in the gift shops, in addition to being able to cover his room and board. This is a view from the porch of the old um, hotel at Yosemite Glacier Point that burned down in the late 60s, uh, again, of half dome. So here are a couple of Yosemite waterfalls. And if you haven't been to Yosemite in a, in a while, it's, um, it's nice to go and see in the Awani Hotel in the lobby there. They have about, um, I'm going to just kind of guess and say, about 10 watercolors of Gunnar's that are on display there, uh, a number of which he painted on commission for the opening of the Iwani in 1927. Uh, and the others uh, have been added since that time. Uh, you can see these are just wonderful depictions of uh, Vernal Falls and Yosemite Falls, or Nagata Falls, sorry. He, uh, 
Here he is painting in the valley. People dressed differently when they went painting in those days. He worked primarily outdoors. He started and probably finished a great many of his works outdoors. He, you know, I'm sure he probably finished a great many indoors, but he worked primarily outdoors, which makes his accomplishment even more amazing because working outdoors is, is a great challenge. It really puts uh, a very different set of demands on the painter because of the nature of the changing atmosphere of light and shade. And, you know, similar to Claude Monet's method of working on a canvas for a, maybe a two-hour period of time and then switching to another canvas as the light changed, Gunnar would work on a subject for a period of time and then as the light changed, put that aside and come back to it the next day uh, at the same time. He, um, he painted... Um, he did a series of paintings that were used on menus in the, uh, in the restaurant in Curry Village at that time. And those were turned into a series of paintings for a small book called Songs of Yosemite, uh, published in um, 1923, that had poems by Harold Symes and then these beautiful illustrations by, by Gunnar. Uh, it's fairly small, it's only about this size. So the paintings are, or at least the reproductions are quite small, but very beautiful. And we have a, a facsimile of this on display in the exhibit. And here are a couple of other examples from the book. Here's another action shot. Trying to pick up young girls and boys. <laughs> Here are a couple of uh, versions of El Capitan. This is one that belongs to his uh, grandson in Sweden, and another nighttime scene, which again is just, I think, a, a fantastic challenge, and he's really able to capture the sense of light. It looks like, I don't know, maybe the sun has just gotten down. <clears throat> but, but again, really able to capture that really wonderful architectural quality of El Capitan. And then this is one that's in the exhibit, looking west at the base of El Capitan. And um, so somewhat inspired by this exhibit, so just a bit of a tangent. Um, somewhat... Oh, I just noticed we're going to cut up, cut off on the top of the slide, aren't we? Um, last summer, I tried to do some watercolors for the first time in about 10 years. And I was never really a watercolor here um, to a very large extent. But I did some watercolors in Yosemite. And I, in, in scenes like this that involve large numbers of trees, I was good for about 10 or 15 minutes. And I rapidly lost interest. And so I didn't go too far on the trees. Um, but Suffice it to say that in addition to his incredible technical facility, he was phenomenally patient. There's a winter scene. He also was able to paint snow uh, in just a very compelling manner. In 1922, he made his first trip to the Southwest. And he visited the Grand Canyon, uh, Mesa Verde, Zion, Bryce, all the great you know, Southwestern national parks. Here's a photograph of him painting in Mesa Verde, probably something one couldn't do today. But he also had friends in high places. He made friends with a number of park service administrators in addition to Stephen Mather. And here are a couple of paintings of, so this could actually have been the result of that particular one he was working on in the photograph. Uh, here are a few examples of some of the Mesa Verde paintings. And based on something that somebody told me about another painting, I'll show you a little bit later, there's a really good chance that he, he painted every rock 
that you see there um, as an individual, not generalizing them or um, mass producing them.